in the Mexican-American War. And that is what I think is the thing that really carries uh, Seymour over. The, the elections are extremely close. At this time period in Connecticut, the Whig and the Democratic parties are really jockeying for power, switching positions of who controls the governorship and who controls the General Assembly every year or two. It's going back and forth. So the Whig and Democratic parties in Connecticut are really um, in close competition at this time. And so Foster runs uh, for the governorship. He's unsuccessful on these two occasions. Uh, and then he decides that perhaps he'll stick closer to home. Uh, he's getting a little tired of the General Assembly, so in 51-52, he runs as the elected mayor of Norwich. In his second term, he is in fact elected without opposition. Again, a sign of the great respect and esteem in which he is held. Uh, on October 4th, 1860, he marries again. And he marries Martha Prince Lyman, daughter of the Honorable Jonathan Huntington Lyman, and, you know, when I first started learning about this, I thought, well, geez, he has a thing for judges' daughters. Um, I guess you can't say a lot about that. It's not a bad thing. So, uh, 1855. Uh, the, the middle of the 1850s are a really momentous time in not only Connecticut's history, but in the nation's history. It is the time that is really, truly leading to the American Civil War. And one of the things that pushes Foster to want to serve at the national level are the problems related to what he refers to and what many Whigs become Republicans refer to as the slave power. And it's right after uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act is passed, which I'll talk a little bit more about, and after uh, the repeal of the Missouri Compromise, which is what pushes Foster to want to go and make a difference at the national level. So uh, he reluctantly resigns his, his state position to take on this federal position, and he says, I confess I like the duties and responsibilities of the state positions. Even when the excitement is greatest and the rush most intense, it suits my taste and temper. In 1865, so he serves throughout in the Senate in 1865, 1867, he is elected uh, president pro tem, or he becomes, excuse me, president pro tem of the Senate. Why is this? Uh, it's the vice president's duty to be president pro tem of the Senate. It's not, I was mean, mistaken, it's not an elected position. Um, it's elected if you're elected, but, but Foster is not elected. He becomes the acting vice president because the vice president, Andrew Johnson, has become president of the United States because of Abraham Lincoln's assassination. So Foster is third in line. Uh, and what is it about Norwich residents almost being president? <laughs> uh, but Foster is only a step away. If the conspirators who had assassinated Lincoln, if the conspiracy had gone as planned, Andrew Johnson would have been shot that evening as well. There is a point uh, at which uh, Foster has gone out uh, to the west and is traveling through the southwest. Uh, some of the uh, Native American artifacts that he brought back with him are here at the Slater Museum. And uh, he gets a call to return to Washington immediately because Andrew Johnson is very, very ill and they don't think that he's going to survive. So again, Foster comes just that close to becoming president of the United States. So, uh, in 1866, he ultimately uh, resigns from the Senate. And he does this because it is traditional to only run three terms, and he doesn't feel that he should run for another term. Uh, for a time period, he lectured uh, at Yale. Uh, in 1870-1876, he is nominated to the state legislature, and then uh, later to the Connecticut Supreme Court. Uh, 1876 to 1880, he serves as a, a government advisor uh, to the state government un until his death. He dies on September 19, 1880, of malarial fever. So that's, I just wanted to give you a chronological overview so you knew where we are at and to kind of get a big picture of who Foster is and the kinds of things that he did. And now I would like to jump into the 1850s, when he becomes a senator and where he is on the issue. And so this is uh, Lafayette Foster, a principled stand against the slave power. This is the Missouri Compromise, 1820. The Missouri Compromise is a, a tremendously important period in American history when it comes to the question of the extension 
of slavery. The Missouri Territory is, is a part of the Louisiana Purchase. It is the first territory, other than Louisiana itself as a state, it is the first territory to attempt to come into the Union to full statehood. And the question is, it applies for statehood in 1819 as a slave state. And the big issue becomes, many Northerners look at this and say, well, wait a minute, I thought we were ultimately going to be doing away with slavery over time. And it, it's the first attempt, it's the first major national argument over the question of slavery extension into the West. And a deal is made. The Missouri Compromise is that deal. And it closes in about 1820, 1821. There's a few variations to it. But ultimately, what this deal says is, it creates the 36-30 line. 36 degrees, 30 minutes, that cuts across the country. Any territory, and my, my pointer's not working here, any territory out of the Louisiana Purchase Territory that comes in after the Missouri Compromise, anything north of it will be closed to slavery. Anything south of it will be open to slavery. The only exception to this rule is Missouri itself. This is what quiets the sectional waters. Uh, Thomas Jefferson had famously said in the aftermath of the Missouri Compromise that it was like holding a wolf by the ears. You can neither safely hold it nor let it go. And I often ask my students, do you understand what that, that metaphor means, what that example means? I said, have you ever been bitten by a dog and you grab the dog and you hold it and you stand there looking at the dog's growling at you and you're going, I can't stay here for the rest of my life holding this dog. But if I let it out, it's going to bite me. That's the problem of slavery moving into the West. And so for many, many years, for 30 years, the compromise, the Missouri Compromise, stands as the sexual, sectional compromise between the North and the South. When the slavery issue explodes again, it is, not surprisingly, over the westward expansion of slavery. When we get new states that come into the nation as a result of the Mexican-American War, the South and the North start arguing, well, is slavery going to be allowed there or is it not? Then you have another issue that comes along. You all know Stephen Douglas, yes? The, you, you guys did an unbelievable Douglas, Lincoln-Douglas debate here uh, a few years ago that I, that I attended. Uh, Stephen Douglas has his own interests. He wants the Transcontinental Railroad to run through the North, and in particular, to run from Chicago. Well, if it's going to run from Chicago, and it's going to move straight west, it's going to go through Missouri. That's fine, because that's a state. It's also going to run through Kansas. And in order for it to run through Kansas, Stephen Douglas needs that territory properly organized with a legislative, with, with a territorial government. And in order to do that, he needs to get rid of the Missouri Compromise Line because he knows he's never going to get that territory organized. The South will never support him on it. And so what Douglas does is he brokers a deal. Very quietly behind the scenes, he brokers, brokers a deal to repeal the Missouri Compromise Line. This is one of the things that causes Lafayette Foster and many other politicians like him to become incensed at what they refer to as the slave power. Now, when I say Lafayette Foster and the men like him, Lafayette Foster was a Whig. Abraham Lincoln was a Whig. Right? When the Whig party begins to disintegrate and fall apart for a wide variety of reasons that I'm not going to go into tonight, uh, they really start to collapse in the early 1850s. And out of the ashes of the Whig party, one of the parties that comes out of this is the Republican Party. And the Republican Party, uh, Lincoln is a moderate Republican, Foster is a moderate Republican. Both of these men believe that slavery is morally wrong. But they also believe that the Constitution supports the institution of slavery. And in fact, it does. And therefore, in order to maintain the sanctity of the Union, both sides, the North and the South, have to abide by essentially the contract that was made by the Founding Fathers when the Constitution and the Union were formed. And Foster is, uh, he, he's conscientiously opposed and morally opposed to the institution of slavery, but like Lincoln, as an attorney, he believes in the idea of the law and of contracts, and he is willing to abide by the contracts and the deals that have been made with the South as long 
long as they abide by them as well. The repeal of the Missouri Compromise Line to Lafayette Foster and to Lincoln and other former Whigs who have become Republicans is like a line in the sand that the South has crossed over. And Foster is incensed by this. And what ultimately then comes out of this is the creation of the Kansas-Nebraska Territory in 1854. So they repeal the compromise. And so there's a series of wars going on in Europe that Foster comments on, and then he places it in the context of what's going on in the United States. And he says this, our own country is agitated by a domestic question scarcely less exciting than war itself. It is fit, however, that our national government should take its tone and impress from the people and from the state governments. It is fit that the voice of Connecticut should be heard and not altogether unheeded in our national councils, declaring, as she does, with one accord, that our foreign policy is peace. Peace as far more glorious than war. That our domestic policy on such a question as now agitates our country is liberty. Liberty and right, not slavery and might. Now this is the year before he runs for the Senate and goes into the National Congress. As he's discussing these issues, he states, We enter, I trust, on the duties before us, with entire respect and goodwill towards each other individually, and as members of different parties. These feelings ought to increase. If the divine precept of doing as we would be done could at once be adopted in politics, it might then prove as infallible a guide as it has been in morals. And I wanted to show this quote to show you the degree to which Foster's Christian faith influences his outlook on things and influences his outlook on the issue of politics. And one of the beliefs that, one of the reasons that he has belief in the idea that politics can in fact make a difference in one's life and in the nation's life. So again, in regards to Missouri, in regards to the Kansas-Nebraska Act, he is at a, a public meeting uh, in New Haven, and this is two days after the May 1854 Kansas-Nebraska Act passed. The House of Representatives passed in the House of Representatives. Foster publicly denounced the measure at a meeting in New Haven, declaring that the time for speech making had passed and that action had arrived. And he says at this speech, he says, "Let us consult." And whatever conclusion we arrive at, let us join heart and hand in carrying it into action. This is the point at which Foster decides, with the influence of others and the suggestion of others, that he is going to run for the United States Senate. And he is going to try and make a difference against what he believes is wrong about this Kansas-Nebraska Act. And so he, he goes into the Senate in 55. His first major speech is on June 25th, 1856. And you have to remember at this time that from 55, from 54, 55, 56, all the way through to 58, there's about a three, four year period here where Congress is, is literally engulfed in, in flames over the issue of slavery and what's going on in Kansas. Because what happens is that they use the process of popular sovereignty in the Kansas Territory to determine whether it's going to be a slave territory or a free territory. And the way that they go about doing this is they say, well, when the settlers get there, they'll set up the form of territorial government that they want, and they'll choose slavery or freedom, and we'll leave it up to them to do it. That's democracy in action. Well, the problem is that Missouri as a slave state is right next to the Kansas Territory, and what, as, as the Republicans argue, Missouri ruffians ride over the border into Kansas, and they take control of the elections, and there's all kinds of fraudulent voting, and a, a, a slave state government is set up there, and then a few months later, a free state government sets up. And so you've got two competing territorial governments in Kansas that are both claiming they are the rightful legislative power, and what are you going to get when that occurs, and the intensity has risen so high? You're going to get bloodshed. Uh, we remember John Brown. Uh, uh, Norwich can claim a lot, but they can't claim the birthplace of John Brown. Only Torrington can do that. And so John Brown goes out there with the purpose of, uh, in his view, uh, God-inspired divine act to root out slavery, and you get bleeding Kansas. 
And so this is what Foster says. This is his first notable speech. He says, and, and this is what's written about the speech, and then I'm going to give you some examples of the speech. He says, this address was marked with calmness and dignity, and yet in its utterances was distinct, manly, and bold. The speaker's hostility to the system of slavery was frankly avowed, while the constitutional rights of the slaveholding states were frankly conceded. And again, this balance between being morally opposed to slavery but understanding the constitutional bounds of it. Uh, an eloquent vindication was made of the awakening public opinion in the North on the subject of slavery in the territories in reply to the sneers at shrieks of freedom, and his shrieks of freedom are from the South. <laughs> this speech established Mr. Foster's position as an able debater in the Senate. It was also received with great favor among observing men in the North, not as an appeal to sexual passion, but as a piece of calm and judicial reasoning, which went direct to the root of the questions at the time. And again, I think these are great descriptions of Foster's character in his 